Today, Libraries, The Dragon in the Library by Louis Stoll and how to make a box file. In today's video, we're looking at libraries. Libraries are the most amazing place because they contain lots of books all under one roof and books bring us knowledge, they bring us entertainment, they bring us comedy, information and empathy which is massively important because books can transport you into the lives and the heads and the shoes of other people so you can feel the emotions they feel and all good human beings have empathy and empathy in liberal doses. Um, libraries today in the UK are under threat. Lots of libraries have been closed and not even all schools in the UK have a library. Although it's law for a prison to have a library, it's not mandatory in schools. So let's take a look at these lovely institutions and rewind back to the beginning. The first ever known library, believe it or not, dates back to the 7th century BC. So libraries are much older than you might have thought. It was for the royal contemplation of the Assyrian leader and was located in Nineveh, which is in modern day Iraq. And there were some 30,000 tablets stored in there, all written in a language called cuneiform, which no longer exists today, a very ancient language. Much like modern day reference libraries, the tablets were all organized according to subject matter. The world's oldest library still in existence is located in Morocco. It dates back to 859 AD and is part of an operating university. The brilliant thing about libraries is they help to educate people and education helps bring about progress and public libraries are open to anyone to be able to borrow a book and take it home and read it and absorb everything inside it in your brain, transport yourself to new worlds um, and find out new information is such a brilliant thing and it's such an important resource that it's so important we try and save our libraries. The biggest library in the world is the Library of Congress in the USA and it has over 168 million books in it. That's more than one book for every person in the UK. The word library is um, got from the Latin word liber or liber, which means book. The existence of libraries ensures that knowledge is available to everyone, not just those who can afford it. So this is massively important and not just for the individual. It raises the education levels of the society as a whole, which is progress in turn for the nation. So when did the first public library come about? Well, that was in 1731. In the USA, Benjamin Franklin founded the Library Company of Philadelphia and it became the first American subscription library so members could borrow books. So you could call it the first truly public library. The first recognised public library came along a little bit later and that was in 1833. It was opened in Peterborough, New Hampshire by the philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie built more than 1,700 public libraries between 1881 and 1919 and so it only seems right that the prestigious Carnegie Medal, which is awarded every year in the children's and young adult book world, is named after him. But we weren't far behind on our side of the pond and moving to the UK, we go to Warrington and Salford and their museums had libraries within them. But it was the Public Libraries Act of 1850 that's the foundation of the modern public library system that we know today in Britain. So there you have it, libraries are just brilliant and they should be protected if cost-cutting measures are trying to get rid of them because we've got to remember they give free access to thousands of books and educational resources that can be used for school purposes. They give a safe, warm, comforting environment that you can go to to quietly read and do homework. They're a great community hub 
and they're important for society. Today's story features a library in it and also a girl that hates going to the library. This is The Dragon in the Library by Louis Stoll. Chapter One, The Hunt for Daddy Fandango. Do you seriously want to spend the first day of the summer holidays with a bunch of dead people? Josh asked. He was a tall, skinny boy with brown skin, a broad nose and tight curls. If you had to pick one word to describe him, he'd be very disappointed in you because Josh believed that a wide vocabulary was very important. They're buried, Kit said. It's not like they're zombies. It's just a cemetery and it's so overgrown it's basically a park. Kit was stocky, pale and red-haired. If you had to pick one word to describe her, it would probably be muddy. A park full of dead bodies, shuddered Josh. I don't care if they're buried. I still know they're there. It was the beginning of the summer holidays and Kit and her friends were sitting on Kit's bedroom floor arguing about what to do that day. Let's go to the library instead, said Alita. There are absolutely no dead bodies anywhere in the library. Yet, said Kit darkly, what if I die of boredom? Alita was about half Kit's size in every direction. Her eyes were black, her skin was dark brown and her thick black hair was divided into two perfect plaits. If you had to pick one word to describe her, it would probably be intense. She had eyes that looked as if they could bore through solid concrete like a meerkat escaping from a zoo enclosure. Josh sat upright, making excited gestures with his long skinny arms. You won't die of boredom. There are so many books at the library. But I don't like books, protested Kit. They have words in them. You don't have to read them, said Alita, but I need to get a book, urgently. It's basically a matter of life and death. But it's so bleh in the library, complained Kit. Please, Alita went on, I need the new Danny Fandango, and if we're not quick, all the copies will be gone. I've been waiting a year to find out what happens next. It was a beautiful sunny day. Kit, Joss and Alita were allowed to walk anywhere within a mile as long as they stuck together. Freedom was theirs, but for some baffling reason, Kit's friends wanted to go somewhere. You had to be quiet and behave. Sometimes her friends made no sense, and not just when they used really long words. If we go to the cemetery instead of the library, we can climb trees, said Kit. This, she felt, was a powerful argument. Or to put it another way, said Josh, if we go to the cemetery, we'll have to climb trees and get mud on ourselves. He gestured down to his pristine trainers. Kit didn't understand how it was possible for shoes to stay that clean. And maybe if we climb trees, Josh went on, we'll fall from a great height and die. We won't die, said Kit. OK, we'll be maimed then, said Josh. I don't want to be maimed. I want to read Danny Fandango. Go on, Kit. We can go to the cemetery afterwards. We promise, said Alita. She gave a pleading look, opening her dark eyes wide and fluttering her long eyelashes. Kit knew that trick. Alita was the baby of her family and she always got her own way. Yes, we promise. I swear on my signed copy of Danny Fandango and the Cauldron of Poison, said Josh. This was a serious oath, Kit knew. Josh kept the book in his bedroom in a glass case, like it was a museum exhibit. Kit wouldn't be surprised if he'd set up lasers and alarms all around it. Go on, Kit, repeated Alita, who was almost as big a Danny Fandango fan as Josh, although not as into lasers. She was more likely to have trained her dog to guard her copy. Alita's dog scared most people. It was big enough to ride like a horse, but Alita treated it like a cute little kitten and had it named Fluffy. She had insisted they adopt it from a dog shelter. Kit wondered how the dog shelter people had stopped it from eating all the other dogs. I suppose we could go to the library first, said Kit, thinking longingly about the overgrown cemetery with its spooky stone angels and matted undergrowth full of cool insects and one blissful day, a rat. But just quickly, all right? Quick as Danny Fandango casting a lightning spell, said Josh. Quick as Lara Fandango casting an even faster one, said Alita. Kit hadn't read any of the Danny Fandango books because reading required sitting still and sitting still was against everything she stood for. But from what Kit had picked up from her friends, Lara was Danny's sister and she was better at magic, but he was the chosen one, so got to do all the fun stuff. 
That sounded familiar. Kit's older brother and sister always got to do the fun stuff. Kit's perfect older sister was perfect in all ways, according to her parents. Kit's wicked older brother was a bad boy and therefore required a lot of shouting and attention. And when he did even the slightest thing right, he got presents. Kit's younger sister was only a toddler and her job was to be adorable and covered in jam. And her baby brother had a tiny screwed up face, cried a lot and was precious and good enough to eat. Kit was nothing in particular. She was average, not incredibly clever, but not stupid, not especially sporty, but not pathetically unable to catch either. When people were picking teams, she was usually picked second or third, never first, never last. The only non-average thing about her was her size. Growing out of her sister's hand-me-downs at an unnatural rate was her most remarkable quality, according to her parents. She was in the top year of junior school now, but had grown out of all perfect older sister's uniforms, so they had to buy her a new one in the spring term. That led to a lot of tutting, but Kit didn't see how it was her fault. She wasn't growing on purpose, it just happened. Let's get it over with then, said Kit. We're going out, she called as she passed her parents and her two younger siblings in the living room. Alita looked shocked by Kit's dad, who was holding the toddler upside down by her heels, bouncing her up and down like a sack of potatoes. Who's a bouncy, 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 he was saying. Alita was too polite to say so, but Kit knew she was thinking that nothing like that would happen in her house, where the adults were dignified, and people were usually the right way up, however old they were. Hello, Mr Spencer. Mrs Spencer, said Josh. Hello, Josh. Hello, Elita. See you later. Don't get muddy, Kit, said her mum, wiping a splodge of baby food out of her auburn hair. She glanced at Kit. Mm, muddier. Then to Kit's dad. The baby's been sick again. Can you pass me a wet wipe? Kit sometimes wondered if her parents might pay her more attention if she had vomit and snot streaming out of her all the time. The Chatsworth Library was a boring looking concrete building with automatic doors that didn't work properly. So you had to approach them and then retreat a couple of times before you could get through. They'd never been to this library before, but the one that Josh and Alita usually went to had closed down a few months before. This looked like any other library though. Inside the walls were covered in posters about getting flu vaccinations and rules about when you could use the computers. There was a little play area with toys for small children. Kit wished they had one of those for kids her age. Maybe a multicoloured ball pit that you could dive into. She'd be at the library every day if they did. The new Danny Fandangos will be over here, said Josh, charging for the children's section. OK, get it quickly. And then we can go to the cemetery, said Kit. The silence in the library was creepy. It made her want to shout really, really, really loudly. In that moment, she caught the eye of a librarian with a long white beard who put a finger to his lips, as if he knew she was going to make a noise. Kit sighed and strolled over to her friends. They were staring at a display of books, or rather, at an empty space in the centre of it. It's gone already, said Alita. Danny Fandango and the Crown of Bones has gone. We're too late, said Josh. This is the worst thing that has ever happened, said Alita, including when Lara Fandango's pet fox lost a leg in book two. They both turned to Kit. This is your fault, said Josh. What? We only got here five minutes after opening time, said Kit. Exactly, said Josh. I bet people were queuing before the library opened, probably overnight. I wish we were older so we were allowed to queue overnight. Kit could think of a million reasons why being older would be fun, but none of them involved queuing. Can I help? said a voice from behind them. Kit turned to see a tall, dark-skinned black woman with her hair in long locks. Her face was open and warm with a wide nose and a full, perfectly lipsticked mouth. Her long nails were painted with squiggly, shimmering patterns. The woman was wearing a name tag that said Faith Braithwaite, and underneath that, Head Librarian. What are you looking for? Faith, the head librarian, asked with a bright smile. The new Danny Fandango, said Alita and Josh in unison. Faith put her hands to her heart in a gesture of shock. Danny Fandango and the crown of bones? Oh no, not being funny. But you've got to get up earlier in the morning if you want to get a copy of that when it arrives. People were queuing up when the library opened. All the copies will be out for at least a week now. Alita and Josh looked like puppies who had just been kicked in the heart. 
A week? That's so long, said Alita. Her eyes filled up with tears. A week, asked Josh, biting his lip. But the Crown of Bones is only 700 pages long. Do people really read that slowly? It's not a race. No one gets medals for reading quickly, said Faith. Josh looked extra sad at that. Cheer up, though, Faith went on. There are other books. That's the point of this place. Read these instead. She produced two identical books from behind her back, as though she'd been holding on to them all the time. Except that was impossible, Kit thought. Her hands had been empty moments before. The books said, The Wizard of Earthsea on their covers. Josh and Elita perked up ever so slightly. Wizard, said Josh, taking his copy. Excellent. The librarian turned to Kit. What about you? Oh, I don't need a book. Kit pointed to her friends. I'm just here for them. I hope you all like libraries. Um, so I thought we'd stay on the library theme, but we're moving over to reference libraries now, which are full of information and documents and archives. And I thought it might be good to uh, make something that will help you with your filing magazine files. Now uh, you can buy these in the shops, but they are so easy to make and they come in all sorts of different designs and patterns. And uh, I'll just show you, these are two that I have made and believe it or not, they start life as cereal boxes. So we are going to need a cereal box, um, some scissors, anything you want to decorate your cereal box with, a ruler, and then I can show you some little nifty tricks as well for labelling your box files after we're done. There's two types of box file you can make. Um, the really easy way is to just cut the whole top section off, then cut down the side section up to a third of the way up and then you'll have your basic file shape and then you cover it with wrapping paper or decorate it however you want. You could do it with a collage, uh, you could uh, paint it and stick stickers on it, whatever you wish. Um, if you keep the sides, it's a lot sturdier, but another type of box file you could make, and this is better for if you're having a standalone box file, is by cutting diagonally um, down to your labelling side. So what we would do is be cutting from the corner here diagonally. So first up you need to get a pencil and you need to get a ruler and you need to measure about a third of the way up or however far up you want the labelling section of your box file to be. Then rule a line across which is what I'm going to do now. And then after you've ruled that line across, rule from the edge of that line to the corner of your packet, uh, leaving a two centimeter a bit at the top. And then do the same on the other side and cut it out. So I've cut out my basic shape. I've left the flap there so that I can cut it off and fold it over and it's got a nice smooth edge which I'll glue down and then I've done the same thing there we go so there we go that's a nice smooth edge and then I've done the same thing here so I'll fold it over and there'll be a good smooth edge okay just to show you I've got some wrapping paper here so I'm going to wrap the box so here you can see I finished covering my box file so it's nearly ready and um, I actually used sellotape which works quite well because it makes it shiny on the little tabs but you could use glue if you've got glue. Uh, you can see I've see taped it there as well to get that lovely pink edge. Right, so the finishing touch for my box file is I've got some old envelopes here and I'm going to cut the corners off now that's it so i've got four corners and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to glue them on to the edges of my box file so i've stuck my four envelope corners uh on to my box and now i've cut a little piece of cardboard which came off my original cereal packet so now you can uh, label it whatever you want to. So for instance, uh, homework, maybe you're gonna put your homework in the file. And then all I need to do 
is to slot it in my envelope corners. There we are, homework. And it means that you can change your labels whenever you change what's in your box file. And there we go, the finished thing. Rather cool, huh? You could also use paper fasteners or just a sticker or other means of attaching, but I think those envelope corners look really, really cool. And if you've got multi-coloured envelopes, that's even cooler, or you could colour in your envelope corners. One box file, all finished and ready for things to be filed in it. And there we are, perfect. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please subscribe and spread the word. Happy library going and happy box file making. See you later, bye.